All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as part of our Soapbox Infectious series. Tonight is our second evening and we're joined by two wonderful sci well, scientists and journalists uh, here to join us to talk about communication of infectious diseases. Just to put it out there, we do have our last one next Wednesday at six o'clock, so hopefully you can join us for the final part of our series. Um, just by a show of hands, how many people came last week? I see a few familiar faces. Fantastic, excellent, thumbs up to you. Uh, for those of you who just came, thank you so much for coming, really appreciate it. Just so you guys are aware, this format might be a little different than what you're used to seeing. So what we have tonight is each of our presenters will give about a 20 minute presentation, and then it comes to you guys to start a discussion. So you guys will be able to chat with the people next to you, people at other tables, and have a conversation about what you've heard, what questions you still have, and what things that make you wonder and ponder. After that, you guys will have the opportunity to then ask our panelists questions to see what they think about some of these bigger questions and bigger issues. Uh, so it should be a pretty great evening. Our first presenter this evening is Adam Hume, and he's a research scientist at the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory, goes by Needle, um, at Boston University. And he'll be our first one sharing with us. Um, well, thank you um, for the introduction. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about um, sort of my talk is broken up into two sections. The first part of my talk is talking a little bit about my background in the lab and in the field. And the second half of my talk is talking about, talking about what I do in the lab and the field. Um, and that's working on um, Ebola and the related Marburg virus. Um, so I sort of already gave that. So the first part I want to talk about first a little bit about my background. So I grew up about an hour north of here. Um, and I've always sort of been interested in science, but sort of initially what got me interested was an interest in the natural world and um, just being outside. And so that naturally drew me to, especially to biology. Um, I, I did uh, my undergraduate at Bates College up in Maine. Um, I got a, a BS in biological chemistry there. And then um, after working in the lab for a year, I decided that I wanted to continue um, with my education in science. And I got a PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Madison in cellular and molecular biology. And so I focused particularly, I was in the, the lab of Dr. Rob Kaleda and my focus was on human cytomegalovirus, so a human pathogen but um, one that is really, really only a problem for um, pregnant women and people who have um, compromised immune systems. Um, so when I finished there in 2010, I was looking for jobs and I wanted to stay in infectious diseases and I really liked virology, but I wanted to switch from DNA viruses to RNA viruses, so I looked at a lot of different positions and I ended up in the lab of Dr. El Elke Muehlberger at the, uh, Boston University in the needle. Um, where I was initially a, a postdoc and now I'm a research scientist there. And for those of you not familiar, this is the needle. It's, um, it's at the BU Medical Campus. Um, and what it's known for is it has BSL-2 and BSL-3 labs. And we have a, not currently open yet, but soon hopefully, BSL-4 lab there. Um, and although I haven't done BSL-4 research here, obviously, I have done some BSL-4 work uh, at the Texas Biomedical Research Institute in San Antonio as a visiting researcher. So just to give you a little bit of background, uh, I think a lot of you here probably already know this. Even if you're not really interested in science, you were bombarded with it in the news about Ebola virus. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about Marburg virus because I actually study Marburg virus a little more and it's basically the same. Um, they're very closely related. So Ebola and Marburg viruses have high fata case fatality rates, anywhere from 25 to 90% if you look at different outbreaks. But if you look at both viruses and if you look at all the cases, all the identified cases over time, it's about 50%. Um, incubation period is around four to seven days, although that can vary anywhere from two to 21 days. Um, there's a sudden onset of symptoms 
It's very generic flu-like symptoms with um, particularly most characterized by um, fever, but usually have chills, malaise, so you're tired and feel weak, um, headache, and then also things that um, have been um, highlighted with the recent outbreak, diarrhea and vomiting, although they have been described in previous outbreaks as well. Um, and then sort of if you are, if your disease um, is progressing, there are, there can be more severe symptoms um, like coagulopathy. So you have dysfunctions in your coagulation system. So when you get a cut, you get coagulation so you don't continuously bleed. So what you actually get is um, coagulation within your bloodstream and um, that can cause clots which are bad but also can cause hemorrhaging because when you do get a cut or something like that you don't have the those clotting factors that you need to block up those cuts. You can also get sepsis like shock and that's mostly from a loss of liquid. Most people or a lot of people think it's from the hemorrhaging but actually only about fewer than half the cases of Ebola and Marbury actually show hemorrhagic symptoms. Most of the loss of liquid is due to diarrhea and vomiting. Um, and that can lead to, um, the, sep the sepsis-like shock can also lead to multi-organ failure and death. Um, so fatal infection usually occurs sometime in the second week of infection typically, although it can be later. Um, and uh, there are no licensed vaccines or treatments currently. There are uh, a few vaccine candidates that were um, tested in the field um, that showed some promising results, but um, more, more, uh, more study, particularly with potential side effects, needs to be done on those. So to study these, um, to study this stuff in the lab, you know, there, there are basically four different biosafety levels for those of you not familiar. So you have a basic biosafety level one, so that's me in the top left with a lab coat and gloves. Maybe you have um, goggles if you're working with a hazardous chemical. Um, and then if you're working with a, a, um, a pathogen that maybe isn't really harmful to humans, you have something like biosafety level two. In the bottom left, that's me working in a biosafety cabinet. And so it's very similar. So my personal protective equipment or PPE is the same. The only difference is I'm working in this biosafety cabinet and the main um, feature of this is that there's air coming out of this vent in the front and then it's sucking air through the back so it's creating a directional airflow away from the researcher and that's prevent any sort of aerosols coming back and getting towards you. And I'm not going to talk about biosafety level three because I don't really work on that. It's sort of intermediate. I actually think it's more dangerous than biosafety level four um, just because as you can see, biosafety level four is um, a little bit of a step up from biosafety level two. So that's, <laughs> so there's, uh, so that's me in a positive pressure suit. That's um, one of two different suit styles that we have at the needle. Um, so it's fully encapsulated. You have air supplied through the hose and there's um, air vents. You can see two of them on the knees and there's a couple on the back that are, have directional airflow. They can, air can only go out. It can't come in through those vents. Um, and then you have gloves that are secured onto the suit. Um, and obviously you don't just work like that, you work in a lab. So the lab looks fairly similar to a standard biosafety level two lab, except there's a whole bunch of air hoses. Um, but there are, some, there are some key differences. You have a chemical shower. So after you're, um, after you're done doing your research at the end, you have to, you have to shower out in your suit um, and wash off your suit. And, it's like being in a car wash. You can't really see very well. It's pretty sudsy. Um, with, you're showering in a disinfectant and then water. Um, and they also have, there's also a directional airflow similar to the biosafety, uh, the biosafety cabinets, um, which we also use within the labs, but the entire lab has directional airflow. So the more infectious areas, so the areas particularly with animals that where um, there can be higher uncontained viral loads, um, have the lowest pressure, and then that air gets um, HEPA filtered before it leaves the building. Um, and the joke, which is true, is that the air that we put out of that building is cleaner than the air that we take in. Um, yeah, and then also all of the liquid that comes out of our building, so out of the facility, um, not only from the shower, but also from um, all of the waste that we generate, which is already decontaminated, but it goes through um, basically a, se a second safety um, 
feature and it goes through the effluent decontamination system. It gets piped down to these really large vats and it basically gets boiled at high temperature and pressure. Um, yeah, so those are just a few of the um, sort of safety features involved with PSL4. And so what do I study? I actually study something that I think is really cool um, and that's bats. And so the, the reason, and, I, and particularly with Marburg virus, um, because there's a better uh, link between Marburg virus and bats than there is with Ebola, um, a number of the initial index cases from at least four different Marburg virus outbreaks are all associated with those index cases going into caves, whether they're tourists or miners working in the caves, and uh, then becoming infected. And so obviously then they noticed this trend. They went and they found, um, there were a few interesting candidates because one of the caves is called Python Cave for a reason because there are pythons on the floor and then there are these bats. Um, but in 2007, John, uh, John Towner at the CDC's lab uh, was able to isolate virus from some of these bats. Interestingly, they were healthy bats. Um, in a cave that was Respond, or where the index case from a recent outbreak um, had occurred. And they, were, they sequenced the virus and it was virtually identical to the sequence of the virus that was found in, in the people from that outbreak. Um, and it's interesting that if you, ex if you experimentally infect these bats, the virus replicates, but they clear the virus and they don't get sick. And so there's a lot of debate about whether this is a reservoir species or not, but for my research it doesn't matter because I'm really interested in figuring out how do they control the virus. And I don't really have enough time to, today to go through that, um, but I just, I, I had to show just one data slide because I'm a scientist. Uh, so these are some bat cells from this species of bat, Rosettus aegyptiacus, and these are infected with Marburg virus and uh, the viral proteins form these inclusions in red. Uh, the green is just a cellular cytoplasmic protein and the blue is just nucleus. I just... Um, so as, as I mentioned, as you, oh, that's what I forgot to change. 2013, because the, um, the recent Ebola, out, uh, Ebola virus outbreak, which started probably in mid to late December 2013. We're not exactly sure when, it, when the index case started, um, but uh, was obviously uh, very different from previous Ebola virus outbreaks. Um, and it actually wasn't finally declared officially finally over until June of this year. Um, so uh, much, much longer, not, in not only in terms of cases, but also in terms of time than any other outbreak. And just to give an idea of, of that, so in May, late May of 2014, um, a few months after the first case had been identified that it was Ebola, it wasn't identified as Ebola until March of 2014, a few months after the index case, um, it looked like it was gonna be any other um, Ebola virus outbreak. But if you look, that obviously wasn't the case when you, when you look at after, afterwards. Um, and so in the summer of 2014, when, when the cases were starting to pick up, uh, basically around this time, um, our lab decided that we w wanted to get involved. Um, so obviously our lab studies Marburg and Ebola, so we're used to dealing with the virus. And it took a while, but in um, April and May of 2015, I, w I went to Sierra Leone and did diagnostics for the outbreak. Um, and then a lot, of, basically all my friends and family, and the first thing my mom asked me is, why you? Um, and sort of my reasoning was, not only was there sort of a moral imperative, but uh, <laughs> I did have a particular set of skills in that I had real-time PCR experience, which is the assay that was used. Uh, it's still sort of the gold standard for determining whether someone has Ebola virus. And I also had BSL-4 experience. So I had experience with, not only with the PPE, but also uh, directly holding and working with Ebola, which um, not many people had. Um, 
Getting, getting there was tough. Took four, ah, the formatting screwed up. Um, anyways, took four flights and a four hour helicopter ride in an old Soviet helicopter, um, which was interesting. Um, there were a lot of challenges there, but it was pretty rewarding and I was completely exhausted afterwards. I was there for about six weeks and I had two days off, uh, including the last day. Um, and so this is me just uh, testing a sample. So this is in a glove box. Obviously you can't have a BSL-4 out in the middle of nowhere Sierra Leone. Um, so you, you improvise. So we had this glove box, which is fully sealed container, similar to a by safety cabinet, but it's fully sealed. And to be able to function in there, you have the gloves through the, um, through the wall, as you can see there. Um, and we did the testing inactivate the sample and then tested it once it was inactivated. Okay. So now I'm going to switch over kind of suddenly to the second part of my talk, which is about communication. And um, first I want to talk about communicating with other scientists because a lot, oftentimes people think, oh, scientists aren't used to communicating, but that's not true. We are used to communicating, but we're used to communicating with other scientists. We're trained for communicating with other scientists. We have a lot of daily interactions with coworkers, with collaborators, uh, whether it's informal, you're asking someone for a suggestion, or whether it's more formal, a lab meeting, uh, a department seminar, um, an inter international conference where you're giving a talk or a poster. Or in, when I was in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone uh, communicating the test results to uh, doctors and nurses at the Ebola treatment units. And then you also have a different format, which is um, in print, so publishing in a journal or publishing a review article or books, but more, think more textbooks than, um, than novels. And as I said, you know, we're trained for communicating with other scientists, but that has, that's beneficial for us, um, but it has drawbacks for when you think about communicating with the public because we're usually loaded up with tons of jargon, particularly when you're communicating with other people in your particular field. Um, and that obviously doesn't translate to people that don't understand what you're talking about. And um, precision and accuracy are paramount, sometimes at the expense of um, not being clear, but at, at the expense of being very um, specific and losing sight of the big picture, which when you're trying to communicate with the public is really what you should be aiming for. And I don't want to demonize jargon because I think it's very important and I probably shouldn't have put the slide in, but basically I just wanted to throw in a few things and just show why it's important to have jargon because you can take really complex ideas and condense them down into really small words or phrases. And, um, but that, like I said, doesn't really work when you're trying to communicate with the public. Uh, so I, I'm just going to talk about a few of my experience communi experiences communicating with the public. Um, so one of them is an outreach program that we have at the Needle, and it's called ID2 for IDing or identifying infectious diseases. And so we go out to um, local elementary schools, and we try to get kids interested in science. and. Um, you know, since our expertise is infectious diseases, we sort of focus on that. And so one of the things that we do is we have them, basically we sort of walk them through the steps and have them think about what they want in terms of making a contained system for studying something. Basically, we get them to make a biosafety cabinet out of cardboard and some saran wrap. But they're, they're usually pretty interested um, in doing that. We, we do other things with them as well. Um, and that's important, getting kids um, involved and getting, getting them excited at an early age because if they're not interested then as, as children, they're not going to be that interested as adults typically. And then I had a very different experience um, when I was in Sierra Leone. And um, so, I, so I, as I mentioned, I had two days off. One, the one day off, the last day was relaxing on the beach, which was nice. And the other day, I actually went and we went with a community group and we went to different um, health community centers um, in the area around Kono, which is the city we were, where the lab was. And 
we were talking with doctors and nurses about the signs and symptoms to be looking out for. And we're also um, talking to, it was almost always, always women with their children there, um, talking with them about what to do if someone's sick, what to do if someone dies. They have a, they had a national number um, to call if someone had died or was sick and they thought that it might be Ebola. And there was a, a lot of, there was a lot of communication, not only in terms of um, speaking with the individual people, but we also um, uh, handed out and hung up a lot of signs about Ebola. So a lot of people aren't able to read. So a lot of them are pictorial, not all of them, but a lot of them are very pictorial. So, um, which is kind of different from public health flyers that you often see here. Um, it wasn't something I had thought about, but, um, and it was, um, it was interesting trying to fight the stigma too. It was a very strong stigma, not only uh, about uh, people who had recovered from Ebola or who's, who had family members who had recovered from Ebola, but also the Ebola treatment unit workers who were selfless and risking their own health and doing amazing work, but there was a really strong stigma against them and um, trying to communicate. We were right next to a health clinic where the lab was, and so trying to communicate with the people that were there for other reasons, that these people should not be shunned, they should be you know, seen as heroes for what they were doing. Um, and this guy, this was James, he was one of, the, one of the guys who would run samples back and forth from the lab, uh, from the uh, Ebola treatment unit, which you can see these buildings were part of, uh, part of the uh, storage area right next to the Ebola treatment unit, and he would run the samples over you can see this is a, the, the samples that are in the bucket here, a bucket of chlorine. Um, and yeah, his shirt says, I'm helping fight Ebola, don't push me away. And they had it both in English and Creole English, uh, which is the Creole in Sierra Leone. Yeah, there were a lot of different signs. And one of the, one of the things that we had to fight was just people not believing Ebola is real. There were a lot of people that were convinced that it was um, that it was some sort of conspiracy, that people were getting infected when they were in, in the Ebola treatment units because a lot of people were going in and a lot of dead bodies were coming out. Um, and so it was, it's tough to explain, tough to explain that away. Um, and very different from communicating, I think, my normal um, research results. <laughs> um, and so in, in the third example of uh, sort of communicating with the public that I want to talk about is just informal interactions. Um, and this happens a lot as, you know, scientists, you know, people always ask you, you, you know, what do you do? And um, I don't always tell them. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. So it, when I tell people that I work on Ebola, I get one of three reactions. My favorite one, of course, is that when they're enthusiastic and they're interested, they say, oh, that's cool, and they ask other questions, typically. Um, another one that I don't mind is people zone out. Their eyes glaze over and they're not interested, which is fine, because I'm not really interested in accounting. But, <laughs> but you know, but pe people got to do it, so that's fine. But the part that's not so fun is when people get their eyes become wide, they back away, they give you the cross, or they say, should I have just shaken your hand? These are all things that have happened when I've told people that I work on Ebola, or they ask if I'm crazy, um, like some family members. Um, the approach depends a lot, um, depends on the audience and the setting. If I'm on the subway, I don't tell people directly what I do. I wait till we're off the subway because I don't want to scare all of the people right around me. Because if you do say it, you will get looks. Um, and it, when I first moved back to Boston, it definitely did make dating tough too because that's a tough one. You know, there were just some, okay, that's it moment. I have a, I have a great girlfriend now, so she's a nurse. She's great. Um, and but a lot of the training um, that scientists have for communicating sort of in, on an informal level with the public um, 
at, or even just communicating with the public at all, because like I said, there's really you, typically no formal training, is when people, friends and family ask you what you do, trying to communicate it to non-scientists, friends and family. Like when I finished my PhD, um, I don't want to finish, when I published my first paper in my PhD, um, my dad said, send it to me, I want to read it. I was like, you don't want to read it. <laughs> send it to me, okay, I sent, it, sent him the PDF. He called me back the next day, he said, I got stuck. I was like, all right, where were you? First word in the title. <laughs> that comes back to the jargon. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah. So it takes, um, it has its challenges. And um, as I mentioned a few times, I think one of the biggest challenges is the lack of training. Um, it's a, obviously a very different audience from people in your particular field, which, as I said, you have training for interacting with, with interacting people in your same field. And it can be difficult even talking to people in slightly different field. Um, if I want to talk to someone about infectious diseases and they work in, you know, plants um, and not in infectious diseases, but plant development, there's, there's a lot of jargon that does not overlap. Never mind someone in physics or someone that's not in science at all. So um, that can be difficult. And then there's a lot, I think, I think the big problem and the one that's difficult to overcome is not, getting, not having things be lost in translation. So you're going from a, a concise, very specific jargon-filled idea, and then you have to sort of expand it because trying to describe certain jargon is difficult and um, you can come up with more broader ideas, but it usually takes up more space, but then you have to crunch it down again. People don't want to spend 45 minutes listening to you tell them what you do when you're sitting on an elevator. You know, you have to come up with that elevator pitch of what you work on. And, oh, my time's running out, sorry. Um, and then for communicating effectively, I think the two big difficult things are that you have to be able to do it in a way that's interesting, but still is accurate. And that can be, um, it can also be tough to change people's minds on uh, controversial issues, but I don't have time to go into that. And so I'm gonna end with my, sorry, my four questions. Um, and these are just sort of to help maybe um, um, bring up some conversation. So one is, is it better to, typically scientists, um, when they're um, displaying, or talking about their stuff, they're talking about their research to a broad audience will go through a science journalist. And the question is, is it always better to have that uh, that intermediary, or is there a place for um, direct communication from scientists to the general public? And then, uh, how can existing methods of science communication be improved? Um, these are just some general, sorry. Um, my third question was, how can, how effective are different forms of media, um, or how are effective are different forms of media for communicating? Is it better to do it through print, through um, t television, through the internet? And then finally, how can we encourage scientists to um, share their data with the public because there really aren't incentives for them to do that. The incentives are for scientists are to publish so that they can get grants and then continue doing, what, continue doing their job. There really aren't incentives for most scientists to share their data and how, how can we encourage that? And with it, sorry, that took a long, longer than expected. Um, I just want to thank my lab and some of our collaborators in Texas that I was able to work with at the CDC um, and Partners in Health in Erasmus University in the Netherlands for allowing me to go to the Netherlands, uh, to Sierra Leone to do diagnostics. All right, Excellent. that's it. Yeah, sorry. Excellent. Let's give Adam a round of applause. Um, so for those of you who just came in, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for our second evening of our Soapbox series on infectious diseases. My name is Jennifer Novotny and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here. Um, so during Adam's talk, I felt like I heard some knowing laughs in the audience of people who've experienced some of these things. So how many people out there identify themselves as a scientist? 
There's a few. Fantastic. A uh, little wavy, that's okay. I'm on that boat too. <laughs> Um, and those of you who do identify yourselves as scientists, how many of you sometimes feel like you struggle talking about what you do and how to share it with other people? Yeah, I think, I think almost anyone about anything we talk about can have challenges along those lines. So our next speaker for this evening is Rod McCollum, and Rod is a biomedical and global health journalist that specializes on reporting the intersection between science, medicine, disease, poverty, race, sexuality, and technology. Rod has written for many different sources out there, including The Atlantic. You can see on the table an article he wrote that'll be part of tonight's discussion. So with that, Let's welcome Rod. Uh, my name is Rod McCullum. Um, I'm just ending, um, I'm a journalist. I'm a science journalist and a medical journalist, specifically around global health and infectious diseases. I'm just ending, uh, I'm just ending um, the night science journalism program here at MIT. Okay. So um, yeah, and that actually brings me up to um, how I got here. Um, when I was younger, I wanted, I grew up in Chicago and in Los Angeles, and I wanted to be a doctor or be a scientist, and it didn't quite work out for me. Um, but I also had this really strong um, sort of tendency to write things and to explain things. So um, I found myself like reading about studies when I was, you know, a little kid or reading about the news or reading about science and just writing like book reports and things like that you know in school and um, somehow I learned that I sort of had this ability to translate science for audiences for wider audiences so I'm sure there, I saw that there's a lot of scientists out here or people who also want to write um, so if you want to pepper me with questions you can go right ahead um, because I'm gonna have some slides but it's not gonna be as formal is Adams, and of course, if you want to ask me about pitching to the Atlantic or, <laughs> or something like that, go 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 ahead with that. So um, yeah, so um, I got into television news. Um, I started off at the LA Times, and that was um, a horrible experience. Um, <laughs> I worked. Um, I got there in college, and this was actually. Um, um, during sort of the height of the AIDS crisis in the early 90s. And um, I was on the business desk, but as I said, I always had an, a love and interest for science and research. So I had done some freelancing um, in college, um, mostly around, um, around the AIDS crisis and mostly the pharmaceutical end. Um, so I went to the LA Times and I started reporting a lot around the pharmaceutical end of HIV, and this was right before antiretrovirals were introduced. So there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of questions. Of course, at that time, a lot of people were dying, a lot of my friends were dying. So I was really interested in that. So I segued into um, television news, and I was working um, at NBC in Chicago, and there was this anchor there, um, Joan Esposito, who used to be a nurse. And she has this segment, well, not she has a segment, but the news has this like four minute segment every day called Health Watch. And all the producers and writers hated it. You know, it's like whenever you would see your name and HW next to your name in a schedule, people would like get really, really scared. But anyway, I really liked it. So I worked with her more and more, and I started to learn more about translating um, research and science and medicine um, from previously my background. I remember had been in print, but learning how to do it in television, which. Many people think it's easy working in TV news, but it's actually um, more of a challenge because you have a shorter space to condense information and you have to um, prioritize what's more important. So when you're discussing, I don't know, um, let's say the story is there is a new, um, I don't know, um, imaging technology for breast cancer that was developed, you know, at some um, um, technology company around here. So how do you prioritize that in a minute and a half, you know? Do you prioritize, you know, the imaging technology angle? Do you prioritize the accessing angle? Do you pri prioritize, you know, I mean, how many people is going to help? What neighborhood is going to go into? What the research pipeline is? There's all these different angles that you could cover that you can't cover fully in a minute and a half. You could do it maybe in a half an hour. You could do it maybe in, you know, 4,000 words. So it is a challenge. So at that time, I started becoming really interested in looking at the intersections between poverty and 
medicine because just going back to our, our, our you know, fictitious made up story of the imaging technology um, for breast cancer. For instance, I'm sure many of you might know about breast cancer, know there's, there's new 3D imaging technology that's available. Unfortunately, most insurance don't, doesn't pick that up. And even more so, the people, the women who need it the most, who are usually um, lacking insurance, obviously they can't get to it or it would be too expensive. So it's a whole, just takes a lot more effort. So I start thinking, when I hear stories like, you know, black women or Puerto Rican women have, you know, this percentage more likely to experience this, there was a lot of stigma, and Adam just talked about stigma and disease. So I was wondering, how can I, in a way, sort of destigmatize, you know, medicine and science? So um, I start doing a lot of reporting on my own. And um, that's how I got here. So I do a lot of reporting for The Atlantic, um, for Scientific American, for um, The Nation, and for a lot of other magazines and TV news, mostly around infectious diseases and mostly around HIV. Um, here's a piece that I did um, from Zambia. Zambia's anti-gay obsession is worsening its HIV epidemic. And Zambia is a landlocked country in southern Africa. It's um, about the size of Texas. It has a, about a 14% um, HIV prevalence in the adult population. More than 1% would be an epidemic, right? So it's, so it's huge there. And it's interesting because when you look at the different um, demographics for some of these stories, I mean, for some of these cases, you see how they shift when you cross geographical barriers. So um, in Zambia, um, what's, what's happening there is the HIV epidemic is primarily impacting younger educated professionals. And that's interesting because in, many com in, in most countries it's not like that. So of course, when you're impacting, when you have a disease that's um, um, impacting so many people who are young, who are professionals, who are, you know, have families, that's taking an economic toll in the country. So there's a big um, problem um, in terms of food security because you know people don't work, they can't buy food or they can't farm. So there's a whole bunch of um, other issues associated with that. So I was in Zambia, and what's interesting to note is that um, the previous political party that was in Zambia, um, like many other political parties, uses wedge issues. In Zambia's case, um, they were using um, just a uh, homophobia to sort of, you know, whip up the population. And for lack of a better reason, I think it's probably because there were other issues going on. So anyway, um, what was happening here in Zambia was um, the government was going out of its way to be um, mean-spirited toward um, gay people. And at the same time, the CDC and some partners had done some research and found that the epidemic on gay people in Zambia is probably two to three times as much as it was in the general population. So that was causing for some alarm because obviously there's a lot of infections that aren't, that aren't, that aren't, um, that aren't being diagnosed. So um, as I said, that was just another, this is just an example of how um, I just try to um, communicate science and um, social issues at the same time as Adam was talking about destigmatizing um, certain things. Um, here's another piece that I did for Scientific American. And, oh, and by the way, please feel free to ask any questions, anybody, if you want to talk about um, reporting on HIV, if you want to talk about um, just communicating infectious diseases, or for the, those of you that are scientists and you have questions on pitching stories or you want to um, think how you can market your work. Feel free to go ahead. Did you have a question, sir? I was just curious about when it comes to. Oh, thank you. I was just curious about when it comes to communicating these ideas to the general public. I mean, whenever I think about uh, like the switch between the jargon that scientific are typically used to to uh, the layperson, I think of this book, um, Thing Explainer, which was this NASA scientist. You know, used the 
1,000, or as he said, 10 hundred most commonly used words to explain things like the Saturn V rocket, where, which he called the Thing Upper Goer V. I mean, obviously that's a extreme version, but what sort of strategies do you typically use for uh, adjusting the language so that most possible number, greatest uh, possible number of people can actually understand it? You're at MGH. Are you a physician? Are you a researcher? Uh, researcher. You're a researcher. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, good question. Um, I think, obviously, when Adam was talking about jargon, I made some notes on jargon. Jargon actually is very useful when you're communicating with people who all have the same language or who all have the same interests. But when you're communicating with people who don't, it's not very useful. Um, what I tend to do, and I think what a lot of um, I think the more demanding journalists do is try to explain, uh, try to explain the work, um, try to explain the science um, in a way that maybe a person with a high school education could understand it. Scientific American is basically written for, um, I mean, it's not a journal, you know, it's not a scientific journal, but it's obviously a. Um, I think what, one of the oldest magazines in the country, if not the oldest, but it's written um, in a fairly sophisticated manner, but it's fairly written for a high school audience. If you have a high school education or maybe some college, you can understand that. I think what, the, what happens with me is I think in terms of priorities, what are, you, what are the most important things that you want to communicate? So if, you are if you're working on um, a study on, I don't know, a nicotine patch, what are the most important takeaways? You know, um, how is it going to be durability? Is it going to be efficacy? Is it going to be the price? Is it going to be um, something else? So you first think about what's most important, and then how much time you have. Um, I don't. I think when you're communicating with the public, um, even if you're communicating with the public, like from MIT or BU, I mean any of this area, I think just using um, just using simple language works. It's hard, I know, because you're taught to think at a much, much more complex level. But if you sort of think about just the building blocks and prioritize, I think it could, it could work out. It could, possibly. But it's just going to take a little bit more effort. Does that answer your question, or somewhat? OK, and you have another question? Just to follow up on that. Sure. Oh. Just to follow up on that. Oh. Lost in translation. Right. Have you ever had issues with when you're trying to simplify it, you actually face criticism from scientific communities that, that you're able to simplify. Right, right. Very good question. Um, did you have a follow up to that? Or? Yeah. No, yeah. That's actually an excellent question. Um, I sort of encountered that, to be honest with you, I could probably say I could encounter that every day. You know, because, I mean, if you're a scientist, I mean, I'm sorry, all of you are scientists, and someone from the Boston Globe is going to report on your scientific discovery or going to report on, on your trip to um, Sierra Leone, they're going to leave something out that you think is important, you know. So what I generally try to do is um, when I'm interviewing a scientist um, or researchers, I sort of ask them, what do you think is the most important issue here? You know, if I only have, you know, 30 seconds, what would you tell me is the most important issue? So I'll ask them, and then I'll ask another scientist, you know, or ask one of his colleagues, okay, I spoke to so-and-so and he says this, that he thinks is the most important. Would you say that too? Because I'm not a scientist, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a journalist, you know. And I mean, I have some understanding of science, you know, and I have some understanding of medicine, but I'm clearly um, not a professional. And um, speaking of that earlier, um, Adam was talking about jargon, and I made a note to myself, and I'm sure sometimes some of you may reach some journalists, um, I'm not gonna mention any names, or you know, some, um, you know, or some outlets where um, the journalists try to come off as scientists, you know, or come off as academics, or have, I mean, I'm not saying they can't have an opinion, but are sort of treading in waters that maybe they're not the most versed in, you know? I think what, to me, um, I think what's made me successful, um, from television to radio to Scientific American to The Atlantic, wherever, to being here, is just being curious, you know, and asking other people, you know, and asking the smarter people in the room, what do you think is, is, is more important? 
um, because I just, you know, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, so I would rather ask the smarter people what do I think is more important. Now, um, someone is always going to be disappointed, you know. I mean, in the previous story about um, in Zambia, there was, um, there was a case of um, the government was accused of not delivering um, TB medications. And tuberculosis and HIV co-infection is a very serious problem in, in sub-Saharan Africa. It's somewhat of a serious problem also in other developing regions, but a very serious problem in Zambia. And um, I did not um, go into detail um, on TB infections only because I think when you're dealing with a non when you're dealing with a non-technical audience, you can only give them so much, so many numbers. You know, I think, and that's something also. And I'm sure where many of you read, you see something just in terms of I don't know, the Atlantic or Boston Globe, but just any late, um, late publication. You sort of figure out what's good in your head and what's not good. And I'm just going to take a guess that probably someone who tries to cram too much information is probably not going to be good for you, you know, because it's just too much to focus on, you know. Um, so I think I have, so I have to make a decision. We all have to make a decision every day in terms of what we prioritize. So, for instance, in this piece um, here for Science of the American, which is on menthol smoking and cancer, which is not infectious disease, <laughs> but, I, but I just have it up here anyway, just in terms of diversity. Um, Scientific American usually um, has this angle that they like research, they like studies, but they like um, real world applications. So I was reading a little community newspaper in Chicago and I just saw just a little blurb that said that um, the city was conducting research on menthol sales um, t targeting black youth. Um, in certain neighborhoods in Chicago. So I said, oh, that's sort of interesting. So I followed up on that and saw there was this whole chain effect of you know, they were interviewing people and a commission you know, um, released a report and the city council was acting on it. So, oops, sorry. So I wrote that piece um, for Scientific American. And sort of interesting, and the only reason I, I put that up is once again, it's another um, example of trying to um, use journalism and trying to use science communication to destigmatize an audience. Um, because I think when most people think of, um, I mean, many people in this audience probably have, when you see African American youth and you see Chicago, you probably already have an opinion, you know? And um, especially when it comes to smoking, because whenever we see often people um, in certain environments, they often have cigarettes. So I spoke to one researcher who actually um, has done research in Chicago um, and elsewhere that found that African Americans, um, not African Americans in general, but some Americans have a genetic predisposition toward becoming addicted to menthol. And I wasn't aware of that. So that was part of the story there. Um, I didn't no, you can get an addiction to menthol, but that, you probably knew about this, but this explains why there's so many people um, who are addicted to, the, well, not addicted, but who abuse cigarettes. And of course, the tobacco industry knew this back in the 60s, which is why they started marketing menthol cigarettes toward um, blacks and Latinos, because they, you know, had this information about the genetic predisposition, which most people don't know about. But a lot of my work, or most of my work, much of my work, is around reporting on HIV. Um, I, I do some contributing to the nation. And I, first of all, I did not, um, I did not, I'm not responsible for this headline right here. Um, but this, um, does anyone know about this case by any chance? No, you, you know about, yeah. So there was this, um, so there was this college, former college student, a wrestler, Michael Johnson, who was, early 20s, um, going back several years, and he was he's black, and he was at a small college in, in, uh, in Missouri, and um, he was later accused um, of exposing, um, of HIV exposure. Not necessarily transmission, but exposure. So um, HIV um, is criminalized in about I think at least 34 states, and by criminalized, I mean um, if you are HIV positive and you have sex with someone and you don't necessarily tell them that you're HIV positive, even if there's no 
um, transmission of the virus, and we can talk about this later, even if you are taking your medications, or even if you are undetectable, or even if you do, I'm not getting to, okay, or even if you do um, use a condom or other protection, you still can be penalized. And in some, ca in, in some cases, if there, if there is exposure, I'm sorry, not exposure, but if there is transmission of the virus, um, the penalties can be even more harsh. And of course, um, there's a whole scientific backstory there in terms of these laws were mostly um, um, enacted during the 80s, you know, during, during the AIDS scare. And um, with the advent of modern antiretroviral medications now, if you have an undetectable viral load, of course, I think the, trans the possibility of transmission is, you know, extremely negligible. But, so that's a whole different story there. So what, so, and also, so what I did here for the nation was I just reported in detail about this case, but used the lens of race and treatment. And I believe one of your, um, was it next week is, it, is treatment? Yes, it's treatment. Next week is treatment, okay, so think about this next week too. But um, anyway, so um, I just did a deep dive into um, the treatment aspect um, of HIV and how poor people and black people are um, just far, far less likely to have access to treatment. If they don't have access to treatment, then they don't know they're positive or they can't, or they'll be able to, or, to transmit it to other people, and then they'll be more than likely to, to be able to, to be prosecuted. So there's just a whole long story there. So what I generally like to do, and this is maybe just a roundabout way of what you're saying, is when I report on HIV or cancer or TB, um, I like to um, discuss the, uh, whoa, one second, ah, here we go, talking about this. And this is the guy we're talking about right here, um, the HIV virus. So generally when I'm, what I, what, generally what I like to do when I'm reporting on HIV is I like to bring up the science and the socioeconomics because I think often they're tied together and many people unfortunately don't talk about them together. So in that case about, um, that we just talked about just in terms of HIV criminalization is a perfect example you know, of science and socioeconomics. And I think to be, um, just whenever I'm looking at infectious diseases, um, often they're gonna go hand in hand somehow. I'm sure you probably found this also the case in, in when you were in West Africa, um, the more educated people probably were less likely you know, to, to um, become infected because they had more information, okay. And thank you. Okay, so um, just talking more, a little bit more about um, HIV um, and reporting on HIV. Usually, um, when I look at HIV reporting, I look at three broad areas, and I think this is how it's mostly seen in the field. Um, there is, oops, um, oops, fast. <laughs> yeah, okay. So there's research. And of course, research would encompass vaccine research, would encompass medication research, and everything that's in the pipeline, things that are being done here at MIT, things that are being done at Novartis, all those types of things. Prevention, mostly what you see when we're talking about HIV reporting, mostly what you see in the newspaper or on television is gonna be around prevention. And that's because it's, for most people to understand, it's easier because for the most part, it's behavior-based, even though now there are biomedical interventions on, on HIV, which is specifically around um, pre-exposure prophy prophylaxis, which I've just been told I have a minute, so I can't talk about that in general. Um, but um, it, prevention is easier, telling people to use condoms, you know, that's, you know, that's sort of easier. And when I say easier, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to slug it off, I'm just trying to say most journalists and most reporters go for it because it's easier. Now, I usually concentrate on research or on treatment, which um, take a lot more effort. Um, treatment, um, I mean, broadly speaking, of course, that's taking medications um, to alleviate symptoms. There is no cure, obviously, so, um, in terms of this disease. So that's also not reported as well. Um, I think when most, just, looking around, um, most, of, most of you, if you read something on HIV in the news, is it probably around prevention for the most part? Or maybe a hunt for a vaccine, something like that, if you read anything at all? I mean, and I'm, 
only because there's just not a lot there. Um, any more questions? Sure. We're actually going to go into the questions. Oh. Uh, we're going to be moving into our discussion ah. part of the evening. So there will be a chance for questions after, but now the conversation part. Um, so as a bit of an intro, uh, Rod did mention, or that was sort of the next slide coming up, it was his Atlantic article that is on the table that might fuel some of the discussion. And so for the discussion part of the evening, we have um, a couple of quick comments for you. Not comments, but so these are some questions that have been brought up by Rod and Adam, things that you guys might enjoy talking about. We're gonna pass around a set of iPads that are on Twitter, so you guys can actually tweet in your questions uh, or responses to these types of questions. Um, the deal is though, in order for us to see these questions, you need to use hashtag MIT Soapbox. So if you tweet and don't have that, we won't know about it. <laughs> So join up with your table mates, your next door table mates, and we will have some conversations about infectious diseases and the way we talk about them. And we'll meet back up in about 12 minutes or so. Um, we just passed around some surveys, and so if you guys would be so kind as to complete the survey, and we will draw one winner to get a set of Contagion coasters and some sub-zero ice cubes to put in the things that are going to rest on your Contagion coasters. Um, so if you guys get the moment to fill it out, we'll be passing around a bowl. But let's go into our Q&A portion. Let's see what questions have come up here. Um, so I guess Adam and Rod, if you guys want to come on up. So let's start, let's start here. Um, both of you can weigh in, see uh, your opinions on it, but do you think the public has a good slash reasonable idea of the research you do slash the science you write about? So I feel like this question is getting at the matter of, um, yep, you can come on up, uh, of what, what do you feel like the public's base level and understanding of science actually is? And I think you both could weigh in on that. Wherever you want. research I do. I think we've stumped them. Uh, my answer is no. No? <laughs> you do not think the public has a good baseline of the type of science you do? I, I don't think so. Um. Hmm? <laughs> no, CSI is not a baseline. Um. Oh. How might you, for your particular particular line of work, how might you try to change that? I think there are a lot of um, really good forums, uh, op opportunities for science to communicate with the public. I think there are two two main issues with. If if you're talking about sort of this is sort of gets at sort of scientific literacy of the public, and I think there are two two things that you have, you have to deal with. One is, are, are there enough f forums, and is there, is there enough communication um, from scientists and, and journalists that are focusing on scientific research? Um, are there enough forums? And I think that, that there are definitely are more now um, than even, say, 10 years ago. There are um, things like uh, BBC Nature News is an excellent website or um, even things like um, National Geographic's Cosmos series is a fantastic, um, and, and a lot of people are interested in that. But I think that there's a certain segment of the population that's interested in that, that's more likely to be able to search that out and find that. But then there's a large section of the population that really does n is not interested in that. And so I think the, the sort of difficult question there is how do you get those, how do you get the people more interested in science? Um, and I don't think that's an easy question to answer. 
What are your thoughts on it, Rod? You sort of have this experience of both trying to get people interested in the science, because that's what you're writing about, and also, I believe, trying to increase the general knowledge of the population. Yeah, I think that um, Adam makes some very good points. I don't think um, there's a clean line. You know, I think that there are, I mean, there's different ways you can go about it. I do think it is, um, I mean, you're, when you're trying to, um, when you're trying to disseminate any type of information to a wider audience, you're going to have to um, you're going to have to ratchet down, you know, the, the skill level. So you do have to, dare I say, dumb it down a little bit. You know, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing all the time. You know, because I think if you're explaining the building blocks, that more people will get interested, and if you're more interested in learning about Ebola, you know, you can read more articles and you can go, you know, you can go higher up the food chain just in terms of information level. Um, I do think um, it's important, you know, as I said, to um, just to provide a basic understanding, but I don't think, I mean, just from a media perspective, I, I think it's really, um, it's just difficult to try to cover all the bases. That's all. There definitely is a lot of material out there. Yeah. Kind of along the same lines, do you then feel like pictures and interactives help make it a little bit easier to understand and digest? I think so, yeah, Absolutely. I think so. I mean, one thing um, earlier um, in the talk I touched on, um, or rather, I think it can. Um, one thing earlier that I touched upon was um, working in television. And for instance, working in television or working in video, it's much easier to show um, you know, to show images, to show animation, to do, to do those types of things, as opposed to trying to describe it in print. So some things it lends itself easily for, um, especially when it comes to process, um, when it comes to the life sciences, but other things it doesn't. So. Absolutely. And I feel like, do you have the similar experience with those infographics you were showing in Sierra Leone? Oh, yeah, definitely. It's, I think, I think, Visuals in interactive um, displays are sort of one of those ways that you can try and get more people interested. Um, but I think, I, th I still think it's tough though. You have to get people interested in, like you were saying, you have to get them generally interested and then they're more willing to dive into more specifics. You have to bring them in the door, you know? Yeah. And then once you bring them in the exactly. door, you can point them in this direction. I have a question. Can I actually ask Adam a question? Of course. I wanted to ask you earlier, what did you think about the media coverage around the <laughs> Ebola crisis, which? Uh, I was, was very upset, particularly early on, because it was very, I, th I think most people in science, and I think even a lot of journalists noted this, that there was a lot of fear mongering going yes. on early on, and that um, there was also a lot of misinformation that led to this fear mongering because the outbreak started getting sort of, um, since it was larger, there were questions like, oh, is airborne? There was no evidence right. ever in that it was airborne, but people had this fear that it was, and that just sort of just balloon their fears and it just made um, a sort of a snowball effect and um, I think that was misinformation you know some of like I said some of that can be stuff that's lost in translation but when it's used the way that I think I think some journalists um, sort of focus on those fears because that gets viewership right um, and uh, particularly on TV, yeah. um, I felt like a lot of the written articles I thought were more sort of level-headed, but a lot of the, you know, TV stuff was just ridiculous. So from a strictly <laughs> clinical perspective, do you think journalism even advanced understanding how Ebola was transmitted or what it was? Do you think those basic I, I questions think that, were answered? I think that a lot. I think that there, there were a lot of good reports out there. Um, I thought it was sort of overshadowed by the really bad, mostly news reports that were out there. Um, and then there was, you know, just the reaction, not only to like what it was over there, but um, when, when right. individuals were being brought back to the U.S. for treatment, there was, um, you know, that was also 
you know, I mean, even when I came back, it was um, not the most straightforward process coming back, you know. When I get up to customs, have you been in to West Africa within the last 21 days? Yes. Right. And then he looked up at me and asked me the question again, and I said yes. And he walked over to the next guy. No one's ever said yes. Right. <laughs> right. That was not fun. Right. I think I mentioned to you when we were sitting down, I was actually um, in Kenya and Ethiopia during um, part of the outbreak in late 2014. And of course, that's in East Africa, so it's away from the impact zone. But just even just the stigma of just being, there was just the stigma of being on a plane and the people in the hazmat suits and the heat, you know, guns when you have to get off. And yeah, so I can. Also, just so you guys know, as the audience, if you have questions or questions that are arising, you can also raise your hand and ask your questions instead of us just working through this list, which we are going to try to work through. But um, that way, sometimes conversation spreads to new questions, and so that's another way to go. Fantastic. Question. Hey, thanks. Stepping back to talking about jargon and, well, kind of. but. Um, I'm curious if you have like a process you go through when you're kind of deciphering a publication, like a peer-reviewed journal publication, like a super science-y journal publication, when you're trying to decipher and translate it, if you have a process that you do? Right. There's this very secretive scientific process called an executive summary, which sometimes <laughs> sometimes works. But I, I understand what you're saying. Usually what I like to do is I like to call somebody um, like an Adam or someone who has experience, a scientist who is in that field who has experience talking with journalists or who has experience communicating ideas and basically just asking them to walk me through it. Okay, so this is what's going on with this vaccine, you know, candidate, a research target, I mean, a, a vaccine target, is that the place on the virus where you just, so I would just generally find a scientist to walk me through it. Or maybe the public. You see, oftentimes on on many projects, it's like the like the lead investigator or the principal investigator. Usually, is pretty communications friendly. So I always ask a scientist to walk me through it, so I can make sure my reporting is going to be accurate. I don't. I can't say that much for everybody, but I do. I don't. I, I don't presume unless it's something that I already am very familiar with. But yeah, I always ask a scientist to decipher it for me. Sure. Awesome. Let's go back to some of these questions. So I feel like um, this one's directed towards Adam, but I think this will tie into the next set of questions. Are there any similarities in message or style when communicating with people in Africa and people in the U.S.? I think there's a lot of similarities. Um, I think and we, the, the topic was brought up about science literacy and. Um, Science literacy in the U.S. is, uh, th there, there, are there are different levels, um, but you pick the average person off the street, um, and uh, I, I don't know that it's necessarily that far off of people in Africa. Um, there's a lot of, um, and I saw one of the other questions I peeked, and uh, it was asking about the anti-science movement in the U.S., and, there's a lot of people, there's, there's mistrust. Some people think that, um, you know, that science is driven by pharmaceutical companies. Um, and even though by very large amounts, the funding from, the funding for science comes from, directly from the U.S. government, but, well, directly, it comes through the NIH and um, National Science Foundation. But um, they, um, there's a, I guess I'll, I'll get back to the question, but I think when, when I try and communicate, I think with the public, usually what I try to think of is how would I explain it to my mom? Right. Um, who, yeah, who does just have a high school degree. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think on that level, it's not that different thinking about talking to someone in Africa versus um, you know someone a random person on the street here. Um, How do you feel yeah, about that? Yeah, I, I think this would be a good um, one for you to weigh in. I just want to jump in. 
Here we go again, sorry. Thank you, I, actually um, the mom test is actually, um, I want to jump in on that because my mom actually um, sort of is my sounding board for um, my writing and my journalism. My mom just, I mean not just, but she has a, I mean she's a college graduate, she's a former nurse and school teacher. Um, but she likes some science and she likes to read, so I actually send her a lot of the things I do, you know. And if it's something on CRISPR or genetics or if it's on HIV vaccine research, only because, as you just said, I feel whatever I'm doing, if I'm doing it for whoever, for Scientific American or Ebony Magazine or or I don't know, the nation or anyone, I just want everybody to be able to understand it. So I feel that if I can report on HIV vaccines and my mom can understand it, then I'm doing good. So. Do you also use the mommy test then in that regard to decide <laughs> what topic is worth highlighting? Is it a way to be mm. like, is this something she cares about? Perhaps other people will too? Mm, yes and no. I mean, I do. I report um, for different audiences, so it depends. I mean, the mommy test for me might work um, if I'm writing something um, for a publication that she might read about or if it's general interest, but I do some r reporting you know, for, audi for audiences like for Scientific American or for Ebony Magazine you know, or for, um, I don't know, The Economist or for you know, Out Magazine, which is you know, the LGBT magazine. So it's, these are much different audiences. So the way that you're going to talk about, I don't know, vaccines is going to differ you know, from Scientific American versus Out Magazine or, or Ebony, which is African American. So it depends, on, it depends on the platform. Okay, and that makes sense. And then does that sort of come along the same lines of who decides which audience gets targeted for these things? Does that come from the, our, the um, publications in which you're writing for? Um, yeah, um, sometimes editors contact me and they have a general interest and I want to do something on whatever, HIV treatment, you know, um, can you talk about this or do you know more about this? Or I want to do something on, um, I don't know, they might have a specific question. So. We're having some museum ghosts <laughs> tonight, apparently. <laughs> yeah, ghosts in the machine, right? Um, yeah, so sometimes it's the editors, but often with me, often these are my own stories. I mean, I think most of the, uh, I think every story that I, that I showed on the slides, um, I pitched myself. Um, I pitched the article that you're reading now on the vaccine um, research that's going on in South Africa, because I was down in South Africa, so I pitched that. I pitched the, you know, the menthol story. I pitched um, the Zambia story. So these are mostly my pitches. I mean, I think oftentimes this is what I see with journalists. The more focused, <laughs> so I guess poltergeist or something, right. right? They might be agreeing with you and that's their <laughs> well, way okay. of showing. And that means it's time for me to stop, okay, so. Okay, do we have any more questions from the audience? We have one last question on the board. It's okay if not. And just so you guys know, if you are interested in continuing this conversation, uh, after this, um, we're gonna go next door to Nako Taco, have a beverage, have some snacks, and we can keep chatting in a little bit more informal and hopefully slightly less poltergeisty environment. Um, so let's do our final question. And I think each of you could probably weigh on, in on this, maybe give a 30 second thought on it, is how do we prevent infectious disease conspiracy theories? Mm -hmm. Can they what? be prevented? Uh, and what are the best ways to encounter them? So perhaps you could leave us with some pearls of wisdom, if you will. Yeah, I've been talking a lot. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. How to counter conspiracy theories. Um, I think, so, you know, obviously I'm thinking about um, when I was in West Africa, and I think um, obviously communication is a big part of it. And in West Africa, there were a lot, the big conspiracy theory was that Ebola wasn't real, that people were just being, you know, having, a, you know, a flu or something. They were brought, being brought into the Ebola treatment units and being killed there. Um, and there were even cases of individuals breaking out or being broken out of Ebola treatment units um, in order to prevent that from happening. Um, and I think one of the big lessons that people learned is that they had to involve 
um, uh, tribal leaders and educate them about this is real, um, you know, get them uh, particularly communicating with local scientists who they trusted and, um, and also, um, and then once these people, influential people were, um, you know, were convinced that it was, a, that Ebola was real, they were able to um, more easily influence um, and convince the community that it was something that was real. And I think also um, things like, I showed some of the uh, posters and billboards which were plastered everywhere um, throughout Sierra Leone, um, and I presume the Guinea and um, Liberia as well. Um, and I think uh, they did, there was a lot of effort um, put into that. Um, Fantastic. Sure. Rod, how yeah. about you? Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank, you, thank you for that answer. If I can just quickly say, um, I agree with everything that you're saying. Um, if I can add one thing, and that would be that I think, and this goes back to what I was saying in terms of just what my work has been doing a lot of, I think that there has to also be a historical context that's given um, here, because actually some of the conspiracy theories um, unfortunately were true. You know, and at some at some point, if you look in the United States, there's a very ugly history of medical experimentation, um, and coarse experiments, and coarse sterilization that often happened on people who were black or people who were brown, and it has also happened in Latin America, and it's also happening now in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So there are things that are happening. So I think it's important that first of all we have to be honest about and, 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 and we have to find out what is happening and we have to report that and we have to get buy-in from the community and they have to see that okay that and just in terms of my what I'm doing as a journalist I have to say okay I understand these things have happened before you know and this is going on um, and this may have happened like the Tuskegee, Tuskegee experiment things like that so um, this is what's happened before um, but this is probably not happening right now, or this is not happening right now, but I do want to you know, let you know that I do, that, that we do recognize, you know, what happened. And I think sometimes from a journalist's perspective, oftentimes um, we dismiss conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. um, but if, you know, there's a lot of people who do have a lot of conspiracy you know, theories around like HIV or different uh, infectious diseases, and most of them are wildly inaccurate, but we still have to understand, I believe, and just in terms of reporting where they're coming from. Yeah, that's all. Absolutely. It's so. all about that communication, if you will, right? So let us thank our two panelists tonight, Adam and Rod. And now on to the raffle part. Uh, so if you guys can put your surveys in here. You can fold them. You can not. Your preference. I think people are folding. Fantastic. We'll give these a good shuffle. While we are shuffling, please do consider coming to our final section next week on the 12th looking at treatment. So we have two people coming to join us, and one of them is going to talk about new diagnostic techniques that have been developed, and the other one is going to talk about developing new vaccines, and hopefully we can get into some more of the challenges associated with these types of situations. So it's not necessarily the science that always slows us down. Um, Adam, would you please draw one for me? This way it's unbiased. The winner is Angela. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Hopefully we'll see you all next Wednesday. And please do consider going next door to Nako Taco and joining us for some more conversation. Thanks.